Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Atheist Alliance International Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Sylvester, a.k.a. Diogenes of Mayberry. And joining me once again is a past guest, Professor Greg Dawes, who was a was a Catholic priest and is a professor of philosophy and religion in New Zealand. And he's the author of two books, Deprovincializing Science and Religion and Galileo and the Conflict Between Science and Religion. So thank you, Greg, for joining us once again. It's nice to have you back on the show. Yeah, thank you. I'm very happy to, to be joining you once again. Yeah. So as, as many of you know who've been following along, uh, first of all, first let me remind you all, like, if you could please uh, remember to like and subscribe. Uh, it's been a couple of weeks since we've been here. I've been super busy at work, so apologize for the delays between shows. So, yeah, so those of you, you've probably been watching uh, the news and you've seen that uh, the Supreme Court in the United States has overturned Roe versus Wade, uh, providing uh, uh, abortion services to women that can now be banned in, in many states. So Greg is here to talk about it to us about that from the aspect of the Catholic Church's opposition, because there's some interesting memes going on around out there. There's there's one in particular that says the Catholic Church will not baptize a stillborn child or give or give a funeral mass to a stillborn child. So just kind of curious what the Catholic Church's uh, position is on that. And Greg's here to, as a former priest is here to talk to us about that. So Greg, so can you maybe just, you said that the history has changed a little bit. So maybe you can give us a little bit of the background. Yeah, I think it's actually an extremely interesting history because the in the um, in the medieval period, most theologians, Roman Catholic theologians, followed the teaching of Aristotle with regard to the uh, well. They referred to this as the ensoulment of the individual ensoulment as in the soul. When did God uh, create the human soul for each individual? Because of course, in Roman Catholic belief, the, the soul is created by God and as it were infused into each individual at some point in that individual's early development. But this was the point, following Aristotle, Many, if not most, Roman Catholic thinkers thought that it was sometime after conception when the fetus was already to some degree formed that the soul was, as it were, emerged or created by God and this person became you know, a human being. The, the fetus had the status of a human being. We actually find this in Dante Alighieri, the great Italian poet of the 14th century. At one point in the Divina Commedia, Alighieri talks about when the fetal brain is brought, brought to full articulation in the room, the prime cause of motion, that of course is God as prime cause, turns in joy to see so much of nature's art and breathes new breath of spirit filled with power within. So when the fetal brain is formed, at that point, according to Dante Alighieri and many medieval Roman Catholic theologians, essentially following Aristotle in this respect, at this point we can speak of the fetus having a human soul or having a human identity. So that allowed for a period it was never very clear how long, because no one was very clear, you know, when this occurred, given medieval knowledge of embryology. But a figure often cited was 40 days after conception, although this was, you know, of course, largely guesswork. But 40 days after conception was a figure often cited for the moment at which the fetus became, you know, had, as it were, human status. And... That, of course, left a period in which the fetus had, well, the fetus was human, clearly, because what else would it be, or the embryo was human, but it didn't have the same moral standing as, you know, as a, a human being. So that was the view which was very, very, very common right through the medieval period. 
and in fact, up till about the 17th century. And in about the 17th century, a number of Roman Catholic moral thinkers started proposing that, no, it was at the very moment of conception that the embryo became a human being and therefore need to be protected, as it were, morally from the very moment of conception. And that view seems to have been based, well, according to one report I read, which is a reliable source, one of the things that was based upon was that some early microscopic observations of embryo suggested, wrongly of course, that there was already a fully formed but very, 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 very small human being present already at that point. And all this tiny human being did was grow over the course of development. In any case, this contributed at least to the idea that the embryo became a human being from the very moment of conception. And then in the 18th and 19th and 20th centuries, this became, it's fair to say, the dominant view supported by Roman Catholic Church authorities. Although even right up to the present time, there are Roman Catholic theologians who would, who would disagree. So the kind of hardline that we see being put forward as a Roman Catholic view at the moment, which is that the embryo or the zygote even is a human being from the very moment of conception, is actually historically quite recent and wasn't a view held by, you know, like people like Thomas Aquinas way back in the 13th century, or Dante Alighieri, who was a devout Roman Catholic poet, of course, writing in the 14th century, and many other thinkers as well. So I think it's interesting that for various reasons, the Roman Catholic stance towards abortion has become a bit more rigid, a bit more um, all-encompassing than it was in the past. So, you know, the Roman Catholic Church has got a long history and it's a complex organization with lots of disagreements, but this is one I think it's worth, it's worth noting. Okay, so if, even if the installment took place in the fetal stage or even from conception, why then would the church not baptize a child who was born stillborn? Right. Well, the first thing, the first point to be made there is that if a child has actually has died, one doesn't baptize a child who is clearly dead. A common practice seems to have been, and, and still is as far as I know, a common practice would be what was called a conditional baptism. So you could say, if you are still alive, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If there was any doubt about whether the, the fetus was, in fact, still, still alive, but if it was clear that the fetus had died, um, then, then baptism would be simply inappropriate because you wouldn't baptize you know, a person who was already dead. So if we, if we go back to St. Augustine's a doctrine that uh, unbaptized infants would go to hell. So if a fetus dies uh, before, or well, it's, it's born dead and not baptized, according to Catholic doctrine, would that child have gone to hell or it would have just been, re re the soul would have been recalled by God or well, what would be well, the doctrine on that? Well, St. Augustine's view was very tough. And in fact, very few Roman Catholic thinkers in at least certainly in the modern period, would hold to that view. Of course, there was a doctrine which became, wasn't a doctrine, there was an idea which became popular that as well as heaven and hell and purgatory, there was a fourth state known as limbo, limbo. which you know, which was a kind of, it was a place for the unbaptized who were innocent, but who, because they weren't baptized, couldn't be, admitted to the presence of God. Interestingly enough, Dante Alighieri, my favorite 14th century Italian poet, <laughs> when he write, wrote the Divine Comedy, this of course was work about a journey through hell, up through purgatory and into heaven, into Paradiso. 
Dante's faced with the same problem because there are lots of pagans whom he greatly admires, people like Virgil, the Roman poet. And even interestingly enough, um, Saladin, the Muslim leader who fought against the Crusaders when the Crusaders invaded the Holy Land. And Saladin had a very good reputation as a kind of, well, of course, he was a Muslim and an opponent, but he was a noble a noble leader who was generous to those who were defeated and who acted well. And of course, Dante shared this common view of Saladin as a, a good man. So what do you do with these good pagans or Muslims who, because they're not baptized, can't go to heaven? So Dante has sort of an upper level of hell, which is not bad at all, actually. It's kind of, you know, it's hell, but it's not... It's not at all, um, it's not terribly unpleasant. So he can place these virtuous pagans, he has to put them in hell, not at this point having, no one's developed this idea of limbo. He's got to put them in hell, but he's found a way of putting them in, a, in the most comfortable possible region of hell because, you know, he has this intuition, of course, that it will be... Um, so, you know, this is the way in which Roman Catholic thinkers have tried to, these are some of the ways in which they've tried to deal with this issue because, you know, lots of people naturally felt that that Augustine's very rigid view was kind of deeply inhumane. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, parents would often be told, look, we can entrust these children who have died before baptism to the mercy of God and, you know, be confident that God will do his best, as it were. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I think it was, it wasn't it Peter Abelard that helped to formulate the concept of limbo as a, as a way to get around that, that these oh. inhumane aspects. I didn't know that actually, but it may well be. Um, Peter Abelard was a very, interesting thinker and a great classical scholar and yeah and a great logician of course a great philosopher yeah. so um that would be that would be to his favor if he came up with this idea but yeah. thank you i didn't i wasn't aware of that i must yeah. follow it up there you go. yeah i remember when i was the research i'm doing on my book on the the philosophers of antiquity and working with through some of through some of dante's works and I, I found it quite interesting that people like he had like I think I think he described them as like the virtuous pagans. So somebody yep. like Cic someone like Cicero and the others would be in would be in um, sort of the first circle. Uh, and I found it uh, quite amusing that he put Pope Boniface in the eighth circle. Uh, yes, for all of his his misdeeds. So. <laughs> yes, of so. course. Um, of course, Dante belonged to a party that wasn't altogether happy about papal power in Italy, so um, he wasn't necessarily inclined to be generous towards popes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the, so theoretically, so a stillborn child would not be baptized, but it would most likely then in Catholic theology be consigned to limbo rather than, rather than to hell. It would probably be the, the Gen gener general thinking around that kind of yeah it was often left and in more recent times it's probably left much vaguer but a sense that well actually of course um vatican ii the second vatican council in 1962 to 65 which led a kind of updating of roman catholic thought and practice second vatican council actually um actually indicated that even those who are not baptized but who are sincerely seeking the truth um, would be, you know, could also receive salvation. And there was, also, there was always a doctrine going way back of what was called baptism of desire, where, you know, you, you would desire baptism for yourself or maybe for your child, but for some practical reason it couldn't occur, but nonetheless, you had the intention, and the intention would suffice in the eyes of God. So it's fair to say, I think, that this very rigid doctrine about the fate of the unbaptized 
was always mitigated to some degree and has been pretty much abandoned in modern Roman Catholic thought. Okay. So, it, so you say it would be inappropriate to baptize a stillborn child. So can you explain why it would be considered inappropriate? Well, simply because if the child is, has already died, then, um, then... It's too late, basically. Yeah, basically it's too late. No, in a sense, if baptism is supposed to have an effect, baptism would have no effect if the child had died. So, yeah. That would be the thinking about stillbirth, although it was yeah. always it was always permissible if there was any doubt to baptize conditionally. Okay, and you're saying that and a funeral mass is, cannot be conducted for stillborn children, only for baptized children. So, so the Catholic parents would would have to just bury their child without without a funeral mass. Yes, although I've noticed that the canon law on this. Um, actually allows for um, a funeral mass with the permission of the local bishop in particular circumstances so it's not a it's not a rigid rule it wouldn't be the usual thing but it's not entirely uh, it's not entirely out of order um, so yeah uh, that's but normally yeah Normally, the general rule is that a funeral mass would only be held for someone who is a, a member of, of the church. Okay. So wouldn't it provide some comfort to the grieving parents, though, to, to have been given that, to give that mass to their, their child? Yes, but of course, there, are, there were other ways of doing this. You could, have a, you could have a mass for the child, which wasn't formally a requiem mass. You could have some other form of of funeral service if the parents wanted. Um, it depends a lot on, well, yeah, a lot is worked out individually between between priests and parents in these circumstances. Um, so it would depend on the, the individual priest and what he's, how, how far he's willing to go to bend the rules, so to say. And also, also what the parents would want. It wouldn't necessarily be bending the rules. There's no reason why you couldn't celebrate a mass in memory of the stillborn child praying for its welfare uh, that would be perfectly acceptable anyway it wouldn't be a formal requiem mass which was a public farewell to the to the deceased commending them to god but it would be it would be something quite equivalent and i suspect that's not an uncommon practice um, but it will probably okay. be a small, a smaller private affair, rather than a big public one. Okay, and you you mentioned sort of the history, and you, you touched on Vatican II. So from from what I know in my research, that the the Catholic Church's approach to family planning, to to birth control, to abortion, uh, mm. comes from the 1930 encyclical Casti Canubi, which during Vatican II there there was I understood there was some very serious reconsideration about that, but then they decided to to double down on the Humanite encyclical and yeah. basically, basically uh, reinforce Casti Canubi that, you know, uh, mm. procreation should, procreation should, or sorry, um, sexual reproduction, or sorry, sexual Congress should only be in, in service of, of procreation. That you, you shouldn't really be doing it just for fun. It should, every time you have sex, <laughs> you're supposed to legitimately be trying to conceive a child and that uh, any, any sort of, fun or pleasure is considered evil in, in the language of Casti Canubi uh, and that anything that would impede the 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 conception is to be considered immoral or sinful. Yeah, yeah. I think this is this is one of the problems with modern Roman Catholic thought is that the the abortion issue in fact this has been true for a very long time. The abortion issue and the uh, contraception issue have become bound up together in various ways. Um, yeah, I mean, the Second Vatican Council modified this view very slightly. It admitted, you know, that um, sex as a way of, you know, um, reinforcing or helping to build the relationship between the couple is, uh, you know, perfectly permissible and a good thing. But, of course, as you just put it quite rightly, the idea 
which became uh, the official Roman Catholic teaching in Humano Vitae in 1967, was that each sexual act must be open to the possibility of conception. The, the history there is very interesting because the Second Vatican Council in 1962 to 65, at some point, looked as though they were going to be discussing this matter. And the Pope of the time, Pope Paul VI, said, no, I will reserve this to myself to decide. So he took it off the table, as it were, for the General Council. And then he appointed a commission, which included um, lay persons as well as and, and women as well as men as well as theologians and priests and the commission actually recommended a liberalizing of the church's view but the pope chose to ignore the um, advice of this commission and came up with this traditional view which as you say goes back to Kasti Kanubi and, and and further back as well so that was, in the eyes of many, many Catholics, a most unfortunate thing. And, and in fact, of course, I think you will find that many, many Catholics just made up their own minds on this and issue ignored. And, and ignored it. But of course, it put, it put others in a very difficult position who wanted to be faithful to the church, but who felt this was you know, this avoiding all so-called artificial contraception was a far too onerous a demand. And, you know, so this has always been a very difficult issue. And certainly when I was a priest, which is, you know, some time ago now, but um, it was very unusual for any priest to publicly restate at least in this part of the world, to publicly restate that church teaching. And in fact, many priests, I suspect, in the confessional and so on, just sort of quietly tried to find ways around it because, yeah. So the whole contraception thing is it's quite a different issue morally, of course, from abortion. And the reasoning behind it is quite different. But uh, the two tend to be conflated and... I think many, many Roman Catholic thinkers have thought that this was a very unfortunate choice <laughs> made in yeah. 1967 by Pope Paul VI. Mm. Yeah, it would have been nice to see them take one, one, you know, nudge into the modern world. So I remember uh, I heard this like 25 years ago from an Anglican pastor, and I never forgot it. Or I guess what I, I guess they're not pastors in the Anglican Church, but the, an Anglican priest probably is the mm. more correct title. And he said, sex is for recreation, unless you're Catholic, and then it's only for procreation. <laughs> yes. I mean, it wasn't strictly only for procreation, but it had to yeah. be always open to, that was the teaching, open to the possibility of conception. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think a lot of that from, from the research I've done on my book, a lot of that comes from the, the penitential works, uh, I think around the 12th, 12th century, 13th century. That were coming into the the the, the canon law, uh, so a lot of this was coming from from that period of time where they were saying that uh, there's there's a really good book. I'll, I'll try to find it for you. The uh, mm. he, the professor did he did like a chart. It's like you know, is it you know you you weren't supposed to to have come to church if you've had sex with like within the last week. You shouldn't be having sex anywhere near a high holy week or a, a high hol holiday. Uh, and it was all these really rigid rules and like you know are you planning to have a child no then no sex are you planning to have a child yes and it was it's quite interesting i'll during i'll well, actually put the put it up in the video when i find it that's that's very interesting because some of that is actually uh remnants of ideas of ritual purity i suspect i know in the eastern church where priests were married i think no don't i'm not entirely certain on this, but as I remember it, um, priests were not to have sex the night before they celebrated the Eucharist, even though they were married men in the Eastern Church. And and women would often not receive communion when they were menstruating. 
But this, of course, this is a different thing again. This is more notions of ritual purity, which you find across a whole lot of religious traditions. And which is not, strictly speaking, a, a moral issue. It's, it's ritual purity is a hard thing to get one's head around, but it occurs certainly in Islam. It's a, it's a you know, in, in the Muslim world, a woman who's menstruating won't hold a copy of the Quran, for example. It's not because there's anything wicked about menstruation. It's because this is something which we're considered to be somehow placing you outside the realm of the sacred. So notions of ritual purity are very mysterious. Um, the anthropologist Mary Douglas wrote a famous book about it, but it's strictly speaking a different notion from that of moral guilt. No one thinks that a woman who's menstruating is morally guilty, but they might nonetheless, she might be considered in some religious traditions ritually impure and therefore unable to engage in certain activities. Then you see that, uh, I've seen that here at temples in Thailand. I, I've heard about it as well. I believe that some of the, the temples in, in Japan as well, that there are signs that mm -hmm. says women, women can't enter because you might be on your period and be ritually impure. So it still yeah. holds, it still holds today. Yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing for students of religion like myself to try to understand because um, I don't pretend I do understand it, but it's, it's such a widespread phenomenon, it's very intriguing. And although Christianity officially did away with this when it broke with the, you know, with the observance of the Torah back in the days of St. Paul, nonetheless these ideas have persisted um, in some branches of Christianity. Mm. Well, isn't, isn't that basically what baptism is? It's a ritual purification at its core? It is ritual purification, but of course it's thought of as having a moral dimension as well, because you're born alienated from God, therefore in a state of sin, which you've inherited from Adam and Eve in the traditional story, and therefore, you know, you are, you need to be, you know, you need salvation. And so it's a bit more than purification from ritual impurity, it's a kind of a a moral, a change in your moral status as well. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And it's funny how, how a lot of this is all tied together and it, it's, some of this is ancient, some of this is new, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. very complicated. Um, yeah. That's why the history of religions is very interesting, as you know, Jason, from your own work. Yeah, yeah. I, would just, I just wish more people understood it, so. Yeah, Especially yeah. when I speak to people who are devoutly religious, and no matter whether they're Christian or, or Jewish or Islamic, or Islamic uh, when I meet very devout people, I understand like that. Why don't you understand the history of, of your faith? I mean, you just accept everything, and mm. you re you know nothing of the history and how things have changed. Like one of the interesting things, like when I mentioned like the the penitentials uh, around the twelfth century and the, the canon law around marriage that. Marriage was not originally a sacrament of the Catholic Church. It, it came out, it only sort of arose around the 12th century when the Catholic Church was trying to break the stranglehold of these powerful landed families that had control over the church. And so they started regulating marriage because, you know, it was quite common to divorce your wife and, and have a political marriage with another family. Um, and so the Catholic Church started regulating marriages and taking it away from the, the secular authorities. And it becomes a sacrament of the Catholic Church. But how many people know that it's only been that way for 800 years and not for 2000? So. It's about the same time, of course, that the, the um, strict regulation of clerical celibacy becomes yeah, enforced exactly. as well. So this is also a development... Um, perhaps not unrelated, but nonetheless, say, development of that period. That's right. Yeah. What's interesting is that the penitentials come out of the monasteries, like these books on the how to be a penitent monk, because there's so much hanky-panky going on that they obviously have to write down what all of these rules are. Uh, mm. And the, the, the most egregious sin was to take semen in the mouth. 
So even the like even bestiality was less of a sin than oral sex to the these these uh, monkish penitents. Um, and then what this professor, uh, his name is his, his name is Brundage, and I'll, I'll pop up the book for the yeah, our it's readers. Yeah, you hadn't heard of this. <laughs> Brundage, Brundage <laughs> says it's these ideas of penitential, uh, like or around the thought around sex, sort of becomes in incorporated into the the laws and the, the canon laws around the ritual purity of sex for married couples so even though the the, the laity had nothing to do with the with the, the, the mm -hmm. community of monks the rules that the monks are supposed to follow about being celibate uh, are being translated over to the the, the, the to the laity that you should only be having sex in in service of procreation so i thought it was mm -hmm. quite interesting that some of these issues yeah. come out of, because if, if the monks and the nuns are supposed to be supposed to be celibate then why do we have to have these rules for them because they're obviously not following the rules so. yeah um, that's that was of course notoriously the case but also um i think i think the the idea that sex was you know legitimate only when open to or in the service of procreation I think that's much older, actually. That seems to be an idea that you find in the early church. I suspect in people like Augustine, but um, but I'm not entirely yeah. certain. Well, there was that was like even I, going I'm not back denying, to Paul. Yeah, yeah, like even going back to Paul, there there seems to be this element of of chastity. But of course, yep. Paul is a Paul is an end times apocaly apocalypticist who doesn't think that the earth is going to be around in thirty years. So, yep. you know, just hold off for a week or two. You know, the the kingdom is coming. You know, same with the divorce that he he says you can't get divorced because what's the point of getting divorced? You know, obviously he's wrong. And two thousand years later, and some some poor yep. Catholic is trapped in a horrible marriage to a, a, an abusive partner. So, but yeah, there there's definitely that streak of asceticism and and chastity in many of the early Christians. Yeah, yeah. No, no, that's certainly true. And actually, sometimes it was because Christian thinkers were influenced by Stoic ideas. So <laughs> there's, it's a complex history, this history as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, certainly with regard to St. Paul's attitude towards um, some of these matters, undoubtedly, you know, if he thinks Jesus is coming back next Tuesday, as it were, then, then there's, you know, a lot of these yeah. things are relativized, but then it becomes a, a more entrenched idea. But I think you'll find that some of these ideas actually come from outside Christianity, from Stoicism as well. So yeah, well, there, was, there was quite a bit of Stoic influence. Yeah, you start getting yeah. the early church fathers like Origen and yeah. uh, what was the other guy's name? Uh, I want to say Origen. Starts with a C, but I can't remember what his name was. Um, well, would it be John Chrysostom? He was one of them, but there's another. I think it was one of the bishops of Alexandria. Um, ah. uh, it's on the tip of my tongue. Anyway, the, the, there was anyway. a lot of quite a bit of Stoic thought that gets incorporated into into the early Christian thinking. And isn't isn't there a legend? Origen castrated himself, or it was a legend that came later that maybe might not have been true. But... Yeah, the, there was a story which you know it's not. I think historians now will cast some doubt upon it, but that was a that was an idea. But of course, um, I think I think we often, you know, often overlook the degree to which early Christian thinking was influenced by elements of Greek and Roman moral and other philosophy. There's a story about Saint Jerome. I think he tells the story himself, St. Jerome, who translated the Bible in, out of Hebrew into Latin. Um, Jerome had a dream in which he was asked a figure, an angelic figure, confronted him and said to him, Jerome or Jerome, are you a Christian? And he professed he was, and he was asked three times. And in the end, the figure said to him, no, you are not a Christian, you are a Ciceronian. <laughs> and of course, what the story is about was the fact that he felt so attracted by Cicero's literature, and he felt that he should be devoting himself entirely to sacred scripture. But so he felt sort of torn between these two worlds. As an educated person, he liked the Roman 
you know, or the, the Ciceronian rhetorical and tradition. On the other hand, it was pagan, so he felt that he shouldn't really be liking it as much as he did. So you get these very interesting tensions um, actually throughout throughout Christian history between yeah. between a between a pagan heritage that on the one hand was pagan and therefore to be rejected, but on the other hand was you know admired and therefore to be appropriated where possible. Um, Saint Augustine, I think, used the image of of plundering the Egyptians, based on a story from Exodus, that you could you could take what the Egyptians had to offer without accepting their their religious views. But so yeah, there are some very interesting tensions there in Christian history, I think. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Well, thanks for joining me today. It's been a wonderful discussion and hopefully our viewers have been <laughs> intrigued by, you know, a little bit more of the the academic side of things that, that we know we don't normally go into. But I know there are people out there that are are sort of in, interested in the intellectual side of things so hopefully they yeah. they they found this discussion interesting so and uh, well, I'll, think, I'll go ahead yeah. no just i think you know just even to even the idea that the catholic church's present stance towards abortion has a long history and the history wasn't always quite as rigid the stance wasn't always quite as uncompromising as it is today i think that's a fact worth worth knowing yeah yeah mm. that's the point i try to make to 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 people is that your religion changes like as i pointed out yeah. with the sacrament of marriage that for the first 1200 yeah. years it wasn't there that that the catholic church the christian church is always evolving and always changing and lots yeah. of things you know that the reformation was was sparked in part by some of these power struggles and the the uh, was it the transubstantiation that the, the bread and wine literally transubstantiate like that was fairly new around some I want to say Pope Innocent uh, around the 1200s uh, promulgated that idea and a lot of people fought back against it uh, mm. so yeah yep. people are saying it's, anyway. it's not in the Bible if you read your Bible it's not in there so Anyway, no, that's that's a very interesting history, which which yeah. you clearly have been doing a lot of work on yourself, which is great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I need to, I need to finish that uh, that chapter. I'm up to 1930 now, so I can finish up uh, the, my chapter on the the Catholic Church's rise, that that their their crushing of of philosophy after about Justinian's time up through about the Reformation and the Rena Renaissance, the Reformation. So I decided like my next chapter will be the Renaissance, but I decided on the history of the church to keep going right up to the modern day. And so I'm, I'm right. up to, I'm up to like 1930 now in Casti Canubi. So uh, slowly course, I've got another, maybe another 50 pages for that, for that uh, chapter. Of course you have to remember just how Aristotelian Thomas Aquinas was. He was mm -hmm. a great champion of the ancient pagan philosopher, Aristotle, whom, yeah. whom, da whom Dante Alighieri describes as the master of those who know. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I have a, a whole yeah. section on the 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 people around the time of of Thomas Aquinas. You actually uh, refocused me on that just to give you yeah. give, give you the credit. I I had kind of skipped over that section on these these sort of academic people like um, uh, Francis was it Francis, Francis Bacon or Roger Bacon? I always miss them mix them up. Uh, um, those those uh, I think would be Roger Bacon was the Roger Bacon. Yeah, medieval so, one. Yes. Yes. Bacon, Abelard, yep. um, all of those. I kind of skipped over them, uh, and then you, you, you rightly called me on it, and I went back and I rewrote a section <laughs> to to flash out like how that there were men who were monks, but yep. who were challenging things, who were experimenting and looking yep. at nature. And so, yep. You know, oh, that's great. Quite interesting. Yeah. I'm very pleased to hear that, Jason. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Good okay. on you. Well, Thanks for joining me again, and uh, we look forward to our next chat, maybe in a, another few months when uh, there's another another hot button topic to talk about, or when your new book is out in a couple of years, we certainly have you come back for that. So, okay, thank you very much. And very I'll, nice I'll send you. you I nice talking to you too. I'll send you that the I'll post it here as well in, in the chat that that the little chart that Brunage did. I found it. Uh, I've got yeah, a bookmark, yeah. so I'll go find it. It's quite interesting. Yeah. So great. Okay, so I'd like to remind everyone. That everyone to please like and subscribe and we'll see everybody again in the coming weeks for our next chat thanks everybody and have a great day bye, -bye.
Okay, thanks for listening. And don't forget, we're on YouTube. So follow us on YouTube. Just search for Atheist Alliance International. And please subscribe and hit that notification bell. We're also on all of your favorite podcast platforms. So make sure that you follow us on there as well. See you next time. Thank you.